Hello everyone and welcome back to Water Child Tarot. Whether this is your first visit or if you're back after uh, a little while, <laughs> I'm back after a little while too. Um, my name is Sarah and thanks for joining me today. Um, this is just going to be a general update as the title of this video suggests. It's been a couple months since I've put a video out and there's a bunch of reasons for that, um, but I've also been doing a bunch of stuff behind the scenes so I just wanted to catch you up and kind of give you um, what I've been up to, what I'm planning for the channel, and um, some new decks, of course, that have come in, and uh, and some new sort of projects um, that I'm planning for the future. Um, so the first update is a, a life update. I got a new job. Um, for those of you who've been hanging out for a while, or if you interact with me on other social media like Facebook or in any of the... Um, tarot study groups, you'll know that I've been kind of interviewing and looking for a new position um, for a while now, and um, I got a really nice job offer um, at a place that's local to me, and it doesn't have a long commute, and it's working with a really great team, so I'm very happy about this. Um, of course, shifting from a part-time work-from-home scenario to a full-time work-from-the-office scenario has really cut into um, you know, my free time and, and um, all the time that I had before to make videos more consistently. So that's something that I've been thinking about going ahead is, you know, am I still going to have a channel? And if so, um, how am I going to work that in with the other things that I enjoy doing? And I definitely do have ideas for other videos. And I want to continue to be part of the online tarot community in a number of ways, including, I think, making videos. Um, how regular that will be uh, remains to be seen. I don't want to make any, um, you know, put a lot of pressure on myself to do something that really is meant to be just for fun. So it'll be as and when um, I have ideas and I have time. But I'll, I'm going to try to do it uh, fairly regularly, maybe one, um, one tarot video and then one update video per month. Um, I do enjoy watching other people's updates um, and... I like that kind of catch-all format where we can just talk about um, whatever we want and not necessarily about, you know, a specific aspect of tarot or specific decks or something like that. So um, look for those. This will be the August update, and then I'm going to try to do one at least monthly. Um, like I said, I've also been thinking about the channel and certainly in context with the conversations that have been going on around sort of YouTube content and deck collecting and consumerism and why are we all here and what are we really doing? Um, <laughs> and um, that's been really useful and helpful uh, for me personally. Um, Renee over at Meadowlark Mystic posted a, a, a kind of a response to this conversation on her channel um, re very recently. And she had some really good advice and kind of questions to ask. And I think what I'm going to do is do another video um, after this one and kind of hone those questions down, maybe add one or two of my own and sort of make that into a tag um, that people can respond to or not, um, but kind of give a list of set prompts um, based off of, of her list and sort of the things she talks about. So I'll link Renee's video. Um, in the description box below, and you can check that out in the meantime. Um, I've also been investigating some other, I guess you could say tarot adjacent, although it depends on how you view tarot, um, some tarot adjacent things. So one of them is crystals. Um, and I, I sort of vowed when I got into this that I would not get into like collecting and dealing with 50 million other things. <laughs> um, so I'm going a little bit outside of that promise to myself, but I, I've always enjoyed crystals and rocks and especially, um, you know, rock tumbling was something I always wanted to do. And so for this, um, for this last holiday season, I asked for a rock tumbler and my partner got me one and it's really been a dream since maybe the fourth or fifth grade to have my own rock tumbler. Um, so I've been, I've been tumbling rocks, uh, or we've been tumbling rocks together. And a lot of these are just things that we find on our walk. Um, we live on a dirt road and the town has to bring in gravel and um, substrate in order to keep the road in good repair, especially after rainstorms. 
And so we just end up with a variety of different things um, from the roadbed. <laughs> and, you know, I don't know what a lot of these are. I assume most of them are various types of quartz. This would certainly look like quartz. Um, and they're not perfect, um, but they're, they're fun. They're fun to, to tumble and to watch come along from a very rough um, stone into something uh, more polished. And um, so, yeah, that's been a lot of fun. I'm also wearing um, a necklace um, that my partner gave me for a gift. And I know that this stone is azurite. Um, and it's kind of, it's got blue and green. It sort of looks like um, a miniature of the earth. You know, it's got blue and green in it um, and little flecks of gold. So it's it's very pretty. I'm also wearing azurite earrings. I don't know if you can see these. I'm going to take one out. Um, so yeah, that's what it looks like up close. So that's been fun. Um, just kind of a fun side thing to get into. You know, rocks are pretty. Um, and I always have a rock. When I do a tarot reading, I like to represent the four elements on the table. So I have a little dish of water for water, obviously. I have a candle for fire. Um, I usually have a rock or something like that for earth. And then usually for air, I'll put out a feather or um, a leaf, something like that. Um, but anyway, the rock tumbling is really fun. And if you um, if you buy a deck from me or trade with me um, or you're a tarot friend, uh, keep your eye peeled on the package that uh, that comes comes in because I'm going to be giving some of these away um, just as little thank you gifts. Um, the other thing uh, that is, I guess for me it's not really tarot adjacent, although I sort of got back interested into it because other people that I follow um, were mentioning their sort of spiritual studies and their spiritual path. Um, and that's Buddhism, and specifically Tibetan Buddhism. Um, I was raised by a couple of hippies who in the uh, late 60s and early 70s got into um, the teachings of Tibetan Buddhism and actually joined a um, Buddhist community here in the U.S. and were very involved in that for many years. And so I grew up around it, um, and I learned basic meditation practice and some of the basic concepts of Buddhism and Buddhist philosophy but never really fully committed to a Buddhist path um, or to um, committing to practice every day or anything like that. But as I've um, been sort of looking at spirituality in general and, you know, what I feel I want or need in my life, I'm, I'm at that point where I want to explore it more thoroughly. Um, and so um, I guess I also want to just throw, throw into the middle of this that I don't find tarot to be a spiritual practice. Um, and I know for many people it is, and that's great. Um, it is kind it can be sort of a self-help and, and personal improvement practice. I, I find it useful in that way to kind of examine uh, questions that you have or difficult issues that you're trying to work through. Um, but for me, it doesn't really fill the, um, I guess, the need or the desire to work more deeply. Um, for me, tarot is more about psychology and I have, you know, at different periods in my life gone through therapy and that's been very useful. It's given me some tools, but in terms of like overarching life path or that kind of thing, um, I feel like tarot is a tool that can help you with that, but it is not a, uh, a path of it in and of itself, or it's not a religion in and of itself. Um, and again, other people may view it differently or use it differently, and that's fine. Um, so yeah, so Tibetan Buddhism. Um, I found a community that's near me um, and that has a very experienced teacher attached to it. And so I've enrolled in a um, an online course. I'm glad that they're at, you know still offering this online. I'm glad that this place is both local-ish, um, you know, it's maybe 45 minutes away if I did want to go there for an in-person program in the future or a personal retreat or something, um, but also this this online class um, that they're offering. And I guess um, it may sound a little strange to take a class in a religion. Um, I was talking to uh, my partner um, who was raised in the Catholic tradition, and I was like, do you think this is kind of like catechism almost? You know, you kind of learn 
stuff about the religion and then you would commit to the to that to to walking on that path at some point you know for catholics that would be like first communion and kind of being indoctrinated into the um into the catholic church and and you know he sort of agreed that, that that's kind of what this sounded like um, what I like about this program is that it's a very much a, you know, if, if at any point you figure out that this is not for you, you can get off, get off the bus and, and do your own thing. And that's fine. You're not making us a, a commitment up front in any way. Um, there is a small fee for the class, but it's very reasonable. And then beyond that, um, there's actually three stages. So you would pay for three different sets of classes over a number of weeks. Um, and then at the end of about a year, you have the opportunity to make that, you know, more lifetime commitment if you want to, if you're at that point. Or you can go back and study more and, you know, take more time uh, if you need more time. So we'll see how that's going. Um, and I don't really feel comfortable sharing um, a lot about that uh, here on this YouTube video. But if you are interested in joining um, a Tibetan Buddhist group, um, I'd, I'd welcome any kind of offline conversation about that. Um, so, and I want to thank um, Natalie Turner Jones over at Sanskrit Blue, um, the Sanskrit Blue channel. She um, really inspired me to kind of look at Tibetan Buddhism again um, and think about it, you know, think about whether that was um, something that I wanted to explore further. And I do. So, so thank you, Natalie. Um, yeah. Um, in terms of this channel, um, I have so many ideas for videos and I've kind of waffled on really what I want this channel to be and what kind of content I want to mostly make. Um, and it's, it's still going to be a mix. Um, and I'll get into more detail uh, about the kind of the whys and the wherefores of my channel content when I do um, when I do my why are we on YouTube kind of tarot tag. Um, but just so you know, I, I have been having some ideas for some more historic um, videos on historic tarots and, and the relationship between old cards and modern day tarot decks. Um, but that's on hold because I need to do some more reading and research. And there's an, actually a deck that's in progress that I really hope gets released because I would like to buy a copy to use um, for some of the videos that I want to make. So um, in the meantime, I'm kind of putting that on hold. I will say that um, there's a lot of great content out there on Historic Tarot, uh, if you dig. There's a new group on Facebook called, um, I think it's just called Tarot History, um, but I'll put a link to them in the show notes below, and you can, um, I think you have to request to be members, uh, be a member, but they seem pretty open um, to new membership. There's also a couple of folks that are doing um, more tarot historic, uh, historic tarot videos um, currently, and I'll link to a couple of these again in the notes below. Um, I will say that not everyone is giving a lot of kind of academic credentials when they when they sort of make claims um, about you know where they're getting their facts or where they're where they're getting uh, their information from. And so I think we could all do a better job, myself included. I, I know some of my earlier videos, I didn't always spell out like where where I read something or where I heard something. But I'll just throw that out there. I think if we're, um, there's been so much stuff that's been made up about tarot, you know, uh, over the last few hundred years as people have tried to, um, I guess, imbue it with more more gravitas, more kind of academic, um, you know, weight than just, oh, it's, it was just a card game. Um, but I think we can be guilty of, even now of doing that too. If we're making claims about old decks and we don't really have any proof or any kind of, um, authority on, you know, what we're saying. So, um, that's just a caution to, to me, uh, as well. Um, but that aside, I still have some ideas for some tarot videos. I don't want to do some comparisons of old decks. Um, but since that's on hold for the time being, I'm probably going to spring ahead and um, do a video uh, or a series probably on kind of um, esoteric tarots starting in the 1800s 
and then coming up through the modern era. Um, and part of that series um, is going to focus on tarots from Japan. Um, I've made a couple of videos on the channel in the past about um, Japanese tarots, but there are there is a whole group of tarot decks that were um, originally published in Japan, and it's fascinating to me because the the interaction between Japanese tarot culture and U.S. tarot culture and development is is very much intertwined and. Um, at least at this point, it's very mysterious to me. I know that uh, Stuart Kaplan's four-volume encyclopedia on uh, the tarot, I believe it's in volume four, that he does talk about um, Japanese tarot. And so there's probably a bunch of information in there, but I unfortunately, I don't have a copy of that, and it's very hard to get. But I do want to explore it in, explore, you know, Japanese tarot history in the form of looking at some decks. Um, so, and we'll be able to do that because um, I went a little nuts on the Japanese auction sites over the past few weeks, and um, I've got quite a haul coming from Japan. Um, I'm just waiting for the last few decks to make it to the warehouse where the the consolidating, the buying company um, is, is holding all the stuff that I've bought, and then they're going to ship it all to me in one box. Um, and yeah, that's going to be, that's going to be interesting. Um, but I don't just want to make a haul video. I, I might, I might sort of do kind of a haul video at first, um, just to kind of show everything that, um, that I purchased. But then I, I really want to look at each of those in depth and kind of do some comparing, um, because it's interesting to me. It's interesting to see how, how tarot, uh, is influenced by the different cultures, um, that, that end up, um, using it a lot and artists' takes on tarot and um, how it meshes with, you know, other traditional thoughts or ideas or, or cultural beliefs in the different uh, countries where it ends up. So, yeah, hopefully we can take a look at that. Um, and then I have some ideas, other ideas for sort of um, curating uh, tarot deck collections, kind of um, how, I, how I have come to curate my collection, at least uh, thus far, um, really inspired by Lisa Papa's uh, series on, um, I think she calls it This or That, where she sort of takes two decks in her collection that fill a certain niche and compares them with each other, and then she'll often say, you know, okay, I'm going to keep this one, and I'm going to let that one go. Um, and her, her, like, This or That series, or her anti-haul videos, um, I've really enjoyed those a lot. It's helped me to become a more critical evaluator and consumer of tarot decks uh, in my purchases. I think I'll do a slightly different take on that kind of video, um, but I have an idea for, for what I want to do for that. So that might become a series as well. Um, and the other thing I really want to get more into, and I've said this in the past and kind of haven't done it, is, is sharing sample readings with you. Uh, you know, real readings that I've done for myself or for my friends with different decks and kind of showing how these decks have their own voice and how they speak. That aspect of it, you know, I don't really have a format for those yet. Um, I've made a couple videos on the channel so far that are along those lines, but I want to have a more, um, maybe more concrete way of presenting that information or making those kinds of videos. All right. Well, before I close out this video, I did want to also mention that I got a, a, a few new decks um, in my collection. Um, so I'm pretty sure I mentioned this a while back in a previous video. Um, I had a relative pass away uh, last year, and I was named as executor of their estate. So one of the things I had to do was go um, after I had uh, gotten my vaccine and it was safe to, for me to travel, I had to go out to their uh, place um, across the country and clear out their apartment and get ready for the estate sale. And um, I, they had mentioned to me in passing that they had tarot cards, but I didn't really think much of it at the time. Um, I didn't ask a bunch of questions um, or want to sort of pry into why they had tarot cards or um, anything like that. But it turns out that they did. Um, they had a bunch of collections. Um, dinky toys, cast iron uh, metal army toys. <laughs> um, 
weird board games, like st war strategy games, um, thousands of books, um, and a couple of tarot decks. And here they are. So any guesses what these are? <laughs> You'll know. You'll know if you know tarot. Um, but yeah, just a just kind of a surprise. These were these were stuffed in the bedside table. Um, there's no box. There's no little white book. Um, but the both decks are surprisingly complete. Um, they're beat up. They're grubby. You can see how dirty that is on the edge. But this is a, an RWS Blushing Fool. I'm guessing you know 1970 or whatever date that would be. No copyright on the cards. Um, a very kind of leathery almost feel to the cardstock um, and I will tell a story on myself <laughs> they are not coded at all here's the fool card so you can see that blushing blushing fool thing um, and classically the high priestess also has like a reddish kind of skin tone um, so that's how we know it's a blushing fool these cards had stains on them and things and including like some kind of dried on crunchy substance on the backs of a few of the cards, kind of a crunchy, sticky substance. And so I thought, oh, I wonder if I can get this off. I tried scrubbing and now I'm trying to find the card. <laughs> so yeah, so I tried cleaning and went a little whole hog on there and actually managed to like go beyond the print on the paper and down into the paper um and you can see some of that oops some of that dried on crud um it actually does have a tight like it's crunchy but i'm afraid to try to remove any more of it fortunately it's not really on the card faces and i didn't damage the card face um so the you know the the blemish is, on the card is here on the back but I didn't go all the way through so thank goodness for that I kind of caught myself but yeah that was a bummer but you know the cards are dirty and creased and stained and old and used and that's okay um they were used by somebody I cared about a lot and so it's kind of a cool memento and it's okay that they're not in pristine condition yeah you can see the three of wands has that like crunchy like oh what is that i don't know but i'm not gonna i'm not gonna try to pick it off because i'm just worried i'm gonna cause more more of a mess um so yeah lesson learned on the card cleaning thing um but it's just cool to have this and it it really is i can see why people want to get a copy of this because the cardstock is different than anything else I've, I've ever felt. I don't know if I like it any more than anything else, but it just, it feels like old pieces of paper. Um, and it does have a kind of a leathery quality. I think that's also might be from the, like the oils and the handling and everything, um, kind of getting into the paper and creating that kind of tactile experience. So that's, that's pretty interesting. Um, but yeah, I never thought, I've never pursued getting a Blushing Fool deck, never thought I would own a copy, and yet, there you go. It showed up. Um, and then the other deck that they had was an Albano Wait. Um, now, I've mentioned this on my channel, and I've actually um, done a little bit more research into the, the Albano Wait deck um, and have some stuff I want to say about it. Um, but the one, the copy that I've had access to is the one that my mother purchased for herself um, in 19, uh, we think it's 1969 that she got it. Um, she was living in Atlanta at the time and there was a head shop that she used to go to down there. And so um, this one is cool. It's These cards are actually more coded um, than the, the Blushing Fool RWS. So they've held up a lot better because of that. Um, they don't have quite that grimy stained look um if they did have some dirt or anything on them i could probably gently clean these without too much of a problem um you can see the edges are still dirty um but the card faces and and the backs are are in nice condition um and i think that's also prevented them from getting as creased and stuff what was funny um was that 
Uh, so over the past year or so, I've, I've gotten um, a lot of readings that I've either done for myself or had other people do for me with the, um, the Ace of Coins or the Ace of Pentacles has come up quite a bit for me. Um, and um, the only card in this deck that had noticeable damage, and you can see where they closed it in a drawer. Can you see that crease um, right here? So as I said, this was in their, their end table in their bedroom, and you can see where they probably closed this um, in, you know, it was like this sticking out of the drawer and the drawer closed and kind of bent the card and scuffed. Um, just that little bit of paint is missing. Um, but I just thought it was a funny coincidence that, you know, this card's been kind of following me around for the last year. And then, of course, this is the only card in this deck that's got noticeable damage. It was just another one of those instances where it's like, yep, that's, that's card's still coming up for you in whatever way it is. Um, so anyway, so this was cool. Um, I now have basically a reading copy of the Albano Wait, um, the one that my mom has, you know, she has back in her possession. And she's kind and she'll let me look at it if I want to, but um, this one's a little bit more broken in. And, you know, because I don't have the box and the booklet and all that, it's not really a collector's item. Um, and I could just read with it. Um, and so I'm very, very happy to have this one um, because I had kind of wanted to get, you know, maybe a... Um, the U.S. Games reprinting of this, but the colors are a little bit different. So, I, you know, I've been thinking about that for a while, but I've been hemming and hawing about it. Um, this is the first deck I ever was exposed to, ever ever really used. And so to have my own copy now that's vintage but not pristine and that I can actually, you know, just use without, without worrying about it too much is pretty cool. Um, so, yeah, I'm just very grateful uh, to... Well, to my relative for for their interest in tarot. Um, I don't know that they... They were very much a recluse and they probably didn't ever do any readings. Um, may not have even done any readings for themselves. Maybe just looked at the cards a lot. Um, it was interesting because in their in their apartment, I also, we also found lots of religious books. Um, lots and lots of religious books of all different kinds of religions. So clearly, to me anyway... Um, this was more of a, like, trying to figure out what works for people and why it works and, and how religion works and how it functions for folks, um, more so than, like, trying to pick a system or, or to delve into a particular belief system. Um, but, you know, being, being a young person in the 70s and, um, you know, or young, yeah, like a young adult in the 70s, and being exposed to all this um, kind of new agey stuff, you know, I can see why tarot was among uh, among the things that they ended up exploring. So, so it's pretty cool. And again, to have that connect, you know, something tangible that I appreciate and that I like anyway, um, that connects me back to them is just a nice uh, a nice way to remember them. So, so that's pretty cool. Um, yeah. Uh, so that's kind of a lot. I'm going to edit down this video so it's not quite so rambling. And um, like I said, look out for my my next video on sort of all things tarot tube. Um, and I would appreciate your, you know, your thoughts and comments on that one as well. And uh, hopefully I'll be able to make content more regularly now that I'm settled into my new schedule um, and make, you know, at least a couple of videos a month. I'd like to do that. Um, and just to keep in touch with you all. Um, I do publish my um, email in my um, YouTube about page. So if you ever want to reach out and just have a side conversation, uh, something you don't want to put in the comments, I welcome that uh, very much so. And uh, for some of you, I know we also see each other on Facebook in some of the tarot groups. So again, you know, feel free to, to message me there. I'm not on Facebook as much um, as I am here, but uh, I welcome those interactions. That's you know, tarot community is important to me. So thanks for everybody for watching. I appreciate all of you and uh, be well and I'll see you soon.